Good morning, everyone. Um, you're very welcome to the Infrastructure Committee. Um, we have a quorum, um, so we're now in, in open session. Uh, today, we will consider subordinate legislation, a departmental briefing on the SL1 Planning Act 2011 Review Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. And we'll also be receiving a departmental briefing on Brexit. Um, I haven't received any apologies. Um, I was expecting Mr Hildage, so he may be just be running late. Um, I have nothing to report as the chair um, for my chair's business. Moving then to item three, which is draft minutes at page six, um, there for the meeting of the 23rd of September 2020. Are members content that they are an accurate reflection of that meeting? Um, I don't know at this point if you want me to bring up because, um, the, the minute uh, of the meeting uh, that took place. I actually stated that I had two matters that I wanted to raise uh, in relation to um, two regulations, the, um, the SL, SL1 on the regulation to do with public service obligations and transport. I said there were two matters that I had concerns for that weren't technical mm -hmm. and I would like the regulations on that basis looked at. I give an example of one of them. However, when I tried to get both of the matters looked at, I was told because I didn't actually speak out the second matter, okay. even though I did raise it as having two matters that okay. were not technical. So I would like to raise that now uh, so that both matters can be dealt with so we don't have to revisit this. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you be ex explicit in relation to those matters that you want to have? Related? I want regulations three and regulation six. So regulations three, just for the members, um, it six says has been raised. Is regulation six. So regulation three, uh, to remove the reference to community law, member states, geographical territory, and to disapply uh, the retained EU regulation to work concession contracts. And I wanted, I thought that was more than technical as it had been described to us. Okay. Thank you, okay. Chair. Thank you. Okay. So. Um, I'm not sure whether that should have been in the minutes or in the matters arising, but it's it's now raised. Yeah, so it was um, under minutes, okay. minutes were raised. So everyone content with the, with the minute as drafted. Um, thank you. Moving then to matters arising at page 12 of your packs. Um, that's again from um, last week's meeting. Do members have any issues to raise in relation to that? Content. Okay. We also have then a list of outstanding um, pieces of correspondence at at page 14. Again, um, they were required to be chased up um, at some stage. I think we're still fairly well within our time on those. Uh, so, okay. Moving then to correspondence. Uh, draw your attention to the correspondence memo at page 20, and also uh, in your tabled papers. At page 21, we have correspondence from the Committee on Procedures on the resumption of its review of LCMs. The committee has listed five issues for consideration in this review. Do members have any comments to make in relation to that? Are you content? I think, okay. Chair, the only, the only issue that has been raised uh, at Business Committee and elsewhere is the um, availability uh, of resource to advise the committee and, and if there are any legal aspects that we wanted to uh, discuss in relation to LCMs uh, and whether or not they were being trans how they were being transposed. I know it's for the minister to decide, but the committee can still ask questions around the process. So I think uh, we would want to be seek assurance uh, that we would have a, a sufficient resource to help the committee with uh, with its scrutiny work in that regard. Yeah, I, I was going to come in similar. I agree with that. Okay. Anyone else? Any comments in relation to that? And is that going to be that's that's been identified by business committee and relayed back? Is that yes? I have already done that uh, okay. from that yeah. person. Okay. Okay. Content. Okay. Um, page thirty-one. We've correspondence from Green Pastures Church offering the use of their car park to provide a park and ride facility in Ballymena. Members, any comment? Are you content to forward that to? The department. Mm -hmm. yeah, the department. Yeah, okay. 
Thank you. Page 33, we have correspondence from the Committee on Procedures on the review to extend the temporary provisions contained within Standing Orders 110 to 116. They are seeking views from this committee on the provisions in the Standing Orders. Members, any comment to make or any thoughts on that? No. No? It was debated yesterday, wasn't it? In the yeah. Paper? Yeah. 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 Content? Yeah. Just in hindsight, if you had anything you wanted to say. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. We all, we all supported it, yes. One. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Then, um, moving then to table papers at page four, we have correspondence from Steve Aiken um, to the Speaker and all committee chairs regarding the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol and Internal Markets Bill. Um, the although the correspondence is from Steve Aiken, and he's, he has on the head of paper, Chair of the Committee for Finance. Um, this um, was issued by um, Mr Aiken in his capacity, not in his capacity as Chair, but as an individual MLA. So, members, any comments in relation to that? Noted. Okay. Moving then to... Um, Tabled at page six, we have the interim report from the examiner of statutory rules, Angela Kelly. I let the table you, papers. Sorry. Um, yes, it is table you. papers, page six. So it's the interim report from the examiner of statutory rules and highlighting two SRs, SR 2020 which is the Motor Vehicles Driving Licences Amendment, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and SR 2020 which is the Taxi Licensing Amendment Number Two, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland. 2020. Um, the committee agreed these two statutory rules subject to the examiner's report. The examiner has now advised that she has no concern regarding these two SRs other than they break the 21 day rule. Um, so, are members content that um, we agree the correspondence memo? Okay. Thank you. Moving then to subordinate legislation. Advise members that um, that the next two SL ones, which is agenda item six and seven, are related, and the papers are the same for both. These proposals um, for two statutory rules are both required to increase the fixed penalty fine and number of penalty points associated with the current offence of using a handheld mobile phone whilst driving. One of the statutory rules is subject to negative resolution procedure and the other is by affirmative resolution procedure. The Department has outlined that mobile phone use by drivers is increasing and that the current penalty is no longer providing a deterrent and is underplaying the seriousness of the offence. It has been a specific offence to hold a handheld mobile phone while driving in Northern Ireland since 2004. It became a fixed penalty offence in 2007 with a fine of £60 and three penalty points. The maximum penalty on conviction in court includes a £1,000 fine and £2,500 for a passenger uh, carrying vehicle or goods vehicle and three penalty points. Um, and you may also be disqualified from driving. Uh, we have Donald Starrett who is available um, if members have any questions in relation to that. So maybe invite um, Donald to come into the meeting. <coughs> Hi Donald, you're very Hi. welcome. Um, just in relation to this, members have any, any questions? Mr Boylan? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thanks very much. You're welcome. Donald, ju just one. Obviously, the, I don't really have an issue, obviously, for the road safety element of it. I'm, I'm just the, the, certainly the six penalty points is, is testament enough to, as to what we're trying to do. The, the issue of the £200 fine, um, I'm slightly concerned in some cases, because I think the penalty points will go on the licence and that's it. The fine element to some of those people who are, you know, you know, social backgrounds that maybe have difficulty in relation to someone. In terms of the consultation, um, was there any reference in relation to that? I think that the responses to the consultation were fairly wide ranging. That there was a good level of support for the two hundred pound fine and the six penalty points. 
certainly it's an issue that uh, in doing the impact assessment, we we looked at probably there's two main things. One was that uh, certainly that the two hundred pound fine would impact on uh, certain people uh, to a greater extent. Conclusion really that we came to was that it's within everyone's gift. This is a serious offence, and mm -hmm. it's within everyone's gift to avoid a fine and to avoid penalty points. And really, what we're trying to do is encourage good behaviour. So, the conclusion was, and it was supported by the outcome of the consultation, that uh, the proposal was uh, um, suitable to bring forward. No, no I appreciate it. And, and, and just when I was reading through that, um, certainly. The, the six penalty points is definitely a deterrent in its own right, but yes. I mean, two of those and I mean you're 12 points and then you're into the system of losing your licence. But I just wanted to find out two or three because I think some people will have a difficulty in terms of the fine element. I think the, I'm not I'm not disagreeing with it, the, the SLs, but I mean the SRs. So I just wanted to raise that point. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Anderson. Um, I just I just want to support what my colleague said because without doubt um, I understand the need for you to try and ensure that there is a greater deterrent and uh, to encourage people not to be using their mobile phones and to stop that practice when when one is driving. Um, I think that notifying and ensuring that people realise that it has and the fixed penalty fine is going to change from sixty to two hundred pound. And then the points, the penalty points from three to six. Um, I would uh, concur from that that two attempts to of using the phone, if you ignore it the first time, the second time, you could lose your license as a consequence of that, and people need to be aware of that. But the £200 fine, I would just um, be mindful of those people, particularly in the most deprived areas, if they are fined £200. Um, and the implications of that of people who may not have that money, what um, what would happen to those people who would struggle to pay £200 um, in, in those circumstances. And this is in line with best practice everywhere else. And I support exactly what, what the efforts that are being made here. I want to put that on record. I think it's, it's probably incumbent on us as, as a department to make sure that when we make this change, that we make it well known, that we raise awareness that it's out there. Uh, both from a penalty points and a mm. fine levels perspective. So there will be a further press release at that time when we are looking at uh, whether we can do a communications piece. And what's the well. time frame for the implementation of this coming into uh, Again, we haven't a precise time yet, but it would be hopeful it would be November. November this year. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kelly. Uh, thank you. Could I say that um, uh, given the fine is correct, uh, because it's only whenever it hits people's pocket sometimes that actually helps to change uh, behaviour. And I know in my own constituency, people have lost their lives <coughs> because people have been texting and using their mobile phone. And I, I, I've been along roads, I've seen lorry drivers you know, using mobile phones whilst they're in command of a lorry. It's quite appalling behaviour. Um, so uh, it's my understanding that where people have low income, there's a graduated response and ability to pay. So it's done over time. So that does take account of people's ability to pay. I just wanted to confirm that. But I would want to say that this is a message that hasn't got across. I, I saw a road safety uh, message in, on the TV the other night. And it's very frightening, just you know, the two-second rule, almost that glance that can have dev devastating consequences uh, for the injured party and obviously a jail term uh, for the driver. So I think it's an important message. But in my experience, unless it hits people's pockets, uh, it very seldom doesn't work. Can I also ask if there's any consideration to roll this out to cyclists at any stage? Because, <laughs> and I say this um, because I happened to be in a situation where I was driving behind a cyclist and was trying to then pass them safely. And they were wobbling over the road. And the next thing is the phone then went into the pocket which is obviously the reason why they weren't then managing the bicycle safely. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, it obviously doesn't apply to cyclists. cyclists. What does is the, uh, the penalty of careless. Uh, there's a, offences of careless or dangerous cycling, so those offences are there, and those can be, well, they can be applied to cyclists. So, mm -hmm. Uh, but the mobile phone specifically, that offence doesn't apply to cyclists, no. Yeah. Well, no, I appreciate that reading the um, reading the the, um, the SL one, but it's just in relation to sort of yeah. consideration as to you know that it's not just motorists who offend in that way. Um, thank you, Mr. Muir. 
Thank you very much, Chair. And apologies, I had to pop out there at the beginning. Um, would there be any clarification given on what constitutes use of a mobile phone? Because there was a consultation in 2018 around that, and um, it was noted that there would need to be action to give clarity on that, and to see what actions are going to be taken to give sort of um, more clarity on the issue about what constitutes use of a mobile phone. I think it's something that. Um, the experience in the courts and the interpretation of the law has proved that there's quite a restricted interpretation at the moment of what does constitute use. Um, and for us to, to change that, and I think it needs to be broadened to uh, cover the, the broad ra range of uses that a mobile phone now can have. There's certain things when the legislation was brought into effect originally, for example, Mobile phones were much more restricted to maybe making calls and possibly texts. There was no video facilities, which there now is. Um, for us to change the law in that respect and to uh, broaden the interpretation of use, we would need to make primary legislation. Um, and I know the minister has been keen to explore how we would do that. Um, for example, uh, there are a number of alternatives that could be getting a better definition of use. Or it could, for example, as they do in Ireland, there's, they have, it's an offence to hold a mobile phone. So use doesn't have to be proven. Uh, if it's in your hand, that's an offence while you're driving. So again, that's, uh, that's another option. So the consultation would explore. As you say, back in 2018, those issues were raised. At some level, I think we'd need to explore it in more detail before we brought forward primary legislation. <coughs> so. OK, thank you. Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Donald. Uh, just a quick question. In GBC here, it's um, 200 fine on, on six penalty points. And in November, they're currently doing a, a review of that. Yes. Do you know, is that started or is that anyway down the road? I know that's not that long ago. We, we were actually, <laughs> without success, I was trying this week to find out the, the conclusion of that. Uh, and we haven't been able to find that out as yet. Again, that's something that we would want going out to consultation again we would want to see what the findings were in gb as indeed we'd want to find a bit more out about uh, what the experience is in ireland and reflect both of those uh, elements in any consultation it would do but um, I, I don't have the final report just at the moment no and then does the department here plan to follow on suit from that do you have another review here we, we would be hoping to, yes we'd be hoping to look at those issues and then go out to consultation on that yeah Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. And of course, this is the, the cause of death on our roads on occasion, so we'll have, to have a serious look at it. I think it's a case that both levels are appropriate to be those who will hurt at getting six points onto their licence, if they already maybe have some points, and interferes with their employment and various things. They've got to be those who can't afford it. There has to be the deterrent across the board, because there's different, different outcomes for different people. Okay, thank you. Um, Donald, we have obviously we have two SL ones here. Can you maybe just explain the difference in the two sure. members? Um, the one of the SL, the reason two is needed is one basically increases the fine from sixty to two hundred pounds, and that will be the negative resolution statutory rule. Uh, the other rule then looks at the penalty points and increases those three to six, uh, and the nature of that. Uh, statutory rule and the powers that it's made under means that it's affirmative resolution, so a debate in the assembly. Members can so again, that will influence our timing in terms of uh, bringing in the, the statutory And rule. just with regards to the time scale for this, yeah. when, do you, oh, the time when do you hope to bring Sorry. this forward? Uh, we'll, really, what we're wanting to do was to get committee views on it, and now we will be looking to schedule uh, a debate. So. Uh, Depending on committee time, that might be late October, early November. Okay. Okay. Members can tell? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Donald. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So, just for the record, um, SL1 amendment of the Road Traffic Fix Penalty Order, Northern Ireland 2007. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly using the powers conferred by Article 59 of the Road Traffic Offenders Northern Ireland Order 1996. The schedule of the Road Traffic Fixed Penalty Order Northern Ireland 2007 should be amended to increase the level of fixed penalty fine from £60 to £200. This amendment will be 
amendment will be achieved by the proposed road traffic fixed penalty amendment order Northern Ireland 2020. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Great. Thank you. SL1 amendment of the road traffic offenders Northern Ireland order 1996. This rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure in the Assembly using the powers conferred by Article 37 of the Road Traffic Offenders Northern Ireland Order 1996, Schedule 1 to the Road Traffic Offenders Northern Ireland Order 1996 should be amended to increase the number of penalty points from 3 to 6. This amendment will be achieved by the Road Traffic Offenders Northern Ireland Order Amendment Order 2020. Any increase to the number of penalty points will also apply when a driver is convicted in court. This will ensure no differentiation in the number of points whether a driver accepts a fixed penalty notice or is prosecuted through the courts. There will be no change to the maximum fines which apply when a driver is convicted in court. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Great. Thank you very much. Moving then to item 8 which is the Planning Development Management Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and that's at page 104 of your PACs. Members will note this proposal was considered via correspondence on the 28th of September, in which members gave their approval for the proposal. This is for the purpose of having a formal record of the agreement. The members listed below gave their consent by email to the proposal for the SL1 it's Michelle McElveen, Andrew Muir, Keith Buchanan, Martina Anderson, Cathal Boylan, Liz Kimmins, and Roy Beggs. Are members content to ratify the SL1? Yeah. Please. Okay, thank you. I suppose the only issue I have in relation to this is that it came very late in the day. Um, we knew that this was going to come to a conclusion by the end of September. And I, I was somewhat disappointed that we didn't receive this in a more timely manner. Um, because we do now meet on on a regular basis, I think that just I think that message maybe was um, was given to the department just in relation to this. Moving then to item nine, which is SR twenty twenty one hundred ninety six, the good vehicles goods vehicles testing amendment regulations Northern Ireland twenty twenty, and you'll find that at page one hundred and eight of your packs. Um, Seamus Fitzsimmons, um, Safe and Accessible Transport Division, is in attendance if we want any further information. Um, members would be content to bring um, Seamus in. That's possible, thank you. This proposal was considered by the committee on the 8th of July and um, we were content. Um, the rule is subject to negative resolution and there's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered um, by the committee. Um, you're very welcome, Seamus. Um, I maybe just want to ask a question, and I'm very positive about this piece of legislation and, 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 have, and have been querying its progress. Um, but just in relation to what comes next, um, and you know, obviously um, this applies to vehicles who haven't undergone substantial changes um, in a technical manner. Yep. Um, how is that clarified, and what declarations need to be made, and what's the timely? What's what? How is that managed? Okay, so there's um, the substantial change is defined, um, and we sort of followed what the FT have and GB, and it's things like um, uh, engine, no change in the engine were originally installed. Um, the chassis, um, the suspension, steering, things like that. So there is an actual list of what constitutes substantial change. Um, but obviously there is other things which are allowed. So obviously for preserve the life of the vehicle. Um, um, so if there's a part goes, you're obviously allowed to you know, replace parts. Um, and some of them may not be available. Um, but And things like um, food and safety. Um, so fit seat belts, for example. Some of the vehicles have seat belts or environmental improvements and things like that, so that it is well set out and there is a list available online for what uh, quantifies a um, substantial change. 
Okay, but um, obviously, is there a declaration made by the owner of the vehicle to say that this has that there hasn't been any change, or you know, are there any checks done um, in order? Is there like a final test in order for to then give those vehicles a, a buy um, for any future MOTs? Not really. Was no, it really done on trust? The state, those vehicles um, would have been um, picked up during test, not present. Um, but um, once they reach their 40 years. Um, they are not required now. Obviously, if something happened and it was found that there was an accident, for example, you know that it was found that there had been a major change, or um, there was there was a spot check or something like that, there done in the vehicle where there was something found <coughs> not to be right. Um, but there is no plan to actually you know, look at those vehicles to say this this vehicle is signed off. Okay, and, and there's no sort of self declaration or anything that will go back into the department for to say. You know that my vehicle meets that criteria as set out by the SL1. No, there's nothing like that. Okay, so it's really just then based on on the age more than anything else. So there's no further check done. Yeah. Okay, and and it, is that do you think is that a, could be a potential problem or you're content um, with that? Well, obviously <laughs> anything sort of open to um, manipulation, you know, but. Um, the, the, the thoughts are that, that um, those vehicles are um, well looked after by their owners and they, um, they take a lot of care of them and that shouldn't happen. You know, um, then that's uh, um, just what we're anticipating. Okay. And you mentioned oh. you mentioned spot checks. Is it likely then that at some stage, <laughs> when they're out on, on one, of their, one of their runs, that someone, a DBA <laughs> enforcement <laughs> officer, might pull them into the side? If they were stopping, their, their lights were too bright, or if there was something, you know, obviously not right, or lights not working, you know, or um, no, uh, <laughs> no uh, noisy exhaust, whatever it was, you know. The okay. Vehicle was pulled over for some reason. No. Okay, no, that's okay. And I just wanted I wanted to check on that. Yeah. You're, you're not going to go to the vintage shows and check around just to see what's going on, though. No. <laughs> just just on that, I, I, some vehicles obviously will have spoilers and side skirts and different things. Yeah. Some of the some of the RSs. I'm just thinking yeah. back in the day. Th those apply okay, but any anybody else wants to apply that will not be allowed. That's the point. Um, but a substantial change, as I said, is well defined. So there is right. um, acceptable things, you know. That and so it, it's more those sort of scenarios where. Um, you're changing the chassis, the engine, steering, suspension, um, the things that are defined, you know, um, axles and so on. So, sorry, that's well, that's welcome, chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Be, I can send the link to the committee if they want to, to see it as well. So. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I ask how will the department ensure uh, road safety in terms of road worthiness of the vehicle given the age? And that's I obviously support what's coming forward, but I want to ensure following up on the questions that the chair had asked. Uh, I, again, um, the road worthiness of a vehicle does fall down to the owner anyway, you know, so the, the MOT um, check is just a, a spot check at that point in time. Um, so six months later, obviously, you know, uh, it is the responsibility of the owner to ensure roadworthiness of the vehicle. Um, the checks we have done, um, and, and as part of uh, leading up the consultation and so on, um, the failure rate for vehicles of that age um, were far lower than, you know, the 30 to 40 year old category, for example. Um, and as I said, it, we, we do consider the owners do take. Um, no, uh, over, uh, more than um, the, the usual sort of character vehicles. So it's over the top of what they do, and they do tend to do low miles, and they tend to only go out infrequently, and so on. So, um, so and as I said, the um, again looking at the um, accident figures, you no, know, they were um, where casualties were involved with vehicles of that age were far lower, and so on than the 30 to 40 year category. Uh, and Chair, just um, another question. Given that there's a reference made to an EU directive of 2014, um, and it is a regulation, despite whatever happens at the end of this year, um, this will still apply? This will still apply, yes. It's not so. going to be determined by or affected by no. being dragged out of the EU? No. Okay, Mr. Beggs. Um, the title of this is Goods Vehicles. Um, I'm thinking lorries um, over this. Uh, uh, 3,500 kilogram, kilogram mass. Um, can you give me the assurance that regulations regarding passenger vehicles over that weight would still continue so that yeah. vintage buses are set were still being used and still would be required to um, be tested? Public service vehicle won't be exempt, so it doesn't matter the size. So yeah. 
whether it's taxis or minibuses, whatever, yeah. any public service vehicle still has to. Um, and that's the same in GB. Sorry? Is that the same in GB? Um, it's the same in GB, yes, sorry. Okay. Any Chair, Mr. Buchanan? Yeah, just a question. It's maybe just a strange terminology. It says here, for the purpose of this paragraph, vehicle of historical interest means a vehicle which the department considers to be of historical interest to Northern Ireland. Yeah. What does that mean in a way? Word that like that? Because you could have a pink Cadillac, for example, which is maybe not of historical interest to Northern Ireland, but it's here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's basically the, the definition at the moment is the, the vehicles over the, the 40 years on the 40 year rolling basis. That's what the department considers to be. So the, the, the interest to Northern Ireland is, is irrelevant? Uh, the, uh, well, because the, the jurisdiction is Northern Ireland, that's just about. Fair enough. Just I didn't want to cut out any pink Cadillac owners out there. <laughs> <laughs> any other, there's, any there's other, a of sitting out down the drive any other questions in relation to this? No. no. Okay, thank you very much, Seamus. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. So um, this rule is um, subject to negative resolution. There's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered. Are members content with this rule? Great. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR2000. 2020-196, the Goods Vehicle Testing Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Great. SR 2020-197, the Motor Vehicle Testing Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and this is at page 129. Proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 8th of July and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 uh, was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Indeed. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-197, the Motor Vehicle Testing Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Members content? Great. Thank you very much. Moving then to item 11, which is SL1, the Planning Act 2011 Review Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, we get receiving a departmental briefing in relation to this. So at page uh, 149, we have the SL1. Um, and at, tabled at page 9, we have Assembly Research Briefing Paper on the Planning Act 2011 and also Review regulations. Um, just welcome to the meeting. We have Angus Kerr, the Director of Planning Policy, who is with us, and Irene Kennedy, who is the Planning Policy Division, and she is with us via Starleaf. You're both very welcome. Thank you very much for coming with us to us today. Um, Angus, do you want to, or Irene, want to make some opening remarks in relation to this, just to set some context? Absolutely, Chair. I'm glad to do that. i get my glasses here. Oh, geez. Well, at least you have yours with you. I helped borrow this pair. Um, is, am I okay with the mic here? Yes, or is you are. Yes. Yeah. Okay, look, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, as everybody knows, the planning system was reformed back in 2015 uh, with transfer of responsibility going for local decisions and plan making to councils. Um, and that involved probably the biggest um, piece of primary legislation to go through the Assembly, certainly at that time, in terms of the Planning Act. Uh, and a raft of um, like over 20 supporting a piece of legislation. But at the time that it was going through, there was an amendment introduced by Mr. Boylan from memory, actually, um, back then. Um, we tried our best. <laughs> <laughs> this is your fault. <laughs> um, that section 228 of the, of the Act um, requires the Department to review and publish a report on the implementation of the Act no later than three years after the commencement of Part 3 of the Act, um, i.e. that would have been April 2018. Um, and at least once in every five years thereafter. So the Department is required by Section 228 to make regulations that set out the terms of the review, uh, and these regulations are subject to Assembly control um, through negative resolution procedure and in front of the Committee today. So um, the delay in meeting the initial time frame of 2018 um, publication um, of the regulations and associate report stems from decisions made under the Northern Ireland Executive Formation and Exercise of Functions. Um, Act. Um, these decisions determined that in the absence of a minister or functioning assembly, it would not be appropriate to make those regulations and to publish a subsequent review of the, uh, uh, the implementation of the Act. 
The requirement to review and publish a report on the implementation of the Act is to ensure the Department monitors and reports on the coming into operation of the provisions within the Act and to provide a level of assurance that the legislative framework for the delivery of the reformed two-tier planning system has been implemented and was done so in a timely fashion. The focus of the review is on implementation of the legislative provisions of the Act itself and the extent to which the original objectives of the Act have been achieved. Um, this will inform whether there is a need to um, retain, amend or repeal any provisions of the Act, and the review will also provide an opportunity uh, to consider any improvements and fixes um, which may be required to the way in which the Planning Act has been commenced and implemented in supporting legislation. Uh, and there's also an opportunity, I think, um, to reflect on other changes um, uh, and improvements that can be made to the planning system that have come out of the recent coronavirus pandemics and, and some of the measures that have been introduced as a result of that. Um, so the principal aim of the, the, the Act originally, just to remind members, um, was really to deliver uh, the, um, the Northern Ireland Executive's decision at that time to transfer the majority of planning functions and decisions to, to councils and um, also at the same time to reform and improve the process. Um, the main reform objectives were to further sustainable development, enhance community involvement in the planning process, um, make more timely decisions in ways that are transparent and demonstrably fair, and allow higher fines for planning offences and reform of the planning appeals system to some extent. It is important to highlight that the review is not envisaged at this stage as a fundamental root and branch review of the overall two-tier planning system. Um, it's still relatively early days in terms of that system betting in and, and understanding how it's working, um, and um, we don't believe that there's evidence to suggest that this is the time for another uh, planning act and fundamental re-examination of the system here, which would take co some considerable time to deliver. However, the Minister is very keen to look at um, further improvements to the system for all stakeholders, including councils, developers, the wider public, um, not just in planning decisions, but also in the delivery of local development plans um, that will provide certainty in the long term, um, uh, and this may not always require legislative change. I think probably as, as, we, as we consider that and, and get into the review, it must be recognised that there are already several work streams and initiatives within the Department that are aimed at improving the effectiveness and efficiency of the planning system, um, and it's important that this work continues in parallel to the review work. Um, so um, there's a number, quite a lot going on in planning at the moment. Um, there um, has been a, a report towards the end of last year looking into the performance of the system, particularly in relation to the performance of statutory consultees and major uh, planning applications, uh, which recommended the establishment of a planning forum, uh, which was established uh, in December. And the work of the forum is, is continuing um, a pace to deliver some of those improvements and implement, take, and implement the recommendations from that. Um, report. Uh, in addition, there was, there's been a new Northern Ireland Planning Monitoring, monitoring Framework introduced, which builds on the three statutory performance indicators um, on performance for major local and enforcement, and adds in further indicators, um, which will be due then for next year's publication now, and will inform um, an understanding of how the planning system is working or not working. There's the ongoing work that we do with the Strategic Planning Group, um, which is the Heads of Planning, essentially. We meet regularly, engage with them, um, uh, and um, try and further continuous improvement throughout the system. As well as that, the Northern Ireland Audit Office um, has advised that it intends to carry out a review of planning system to, to at both local and central level. And um, hoping for this review has already commenced. The Northern Ireland Audit Office recently advised that its audit team has completed its preliminary work and has decided to, that a full study review should now be undertaken. In doing so, the Northern Ireland Audit Office has set out an outline of its proposed approach, focusing on matters including cost, pre and post transfer of planning function, staff allocation, and global development. Sorry, plan. sorry, Angus, you wouldn't mind moving across slightly because apparently broadcast aren't picking you up. Oh, sorry. Turn the mic over. Turn the mic over to the mic. <clears throat> Turn the mic over to us. Madam Chair, we're trying to establish where the interference is coming from as well. Somebody's hitting the microphone somewhere. I think um, it may be. I don't think it's in here. It's Sorry, Irene. I think there may be an issue just in relation to your mic and maybe the papers being quite close to it, and it's causing a bit of a rustle in the background. So apologies. Yeah, thank you. Are we counting it? Okay. Um, so, so um, yes, I was just talking about the, the Northern Ireland Audit Office review um, and the approach focusing on a number of issues, um, both in central plan government planning um, functions with ourselves and also at the council level. 
Added to that, the CBI have commissioned Jim McKinnon, who is retired Chief Planner, uh, to explore any planning issues which may pose barriers to making progress on reasonably significant development, um, and they propo are proposing to release a report um, th this autumn on that. Um, and of course, as, as, as many of you will be aware, the Public Accounts Committee has also been looking into planning. Um, the Permanent Secretary um, was, was up uh, in front of, of, that, of that committee, and they, they are probing further and asking questions about how the planning system is running as well. So there's a lot going on uh, in parallel with um, the review of the Act. So just before I finish, maybe just um, to kind of touch on, on possibly next steps and what happens af after this. So, so obviously today uh, is important in terms of engaging with the, the committee on the, the actual statutory rule, which will set out the terms of reference for the review. Um, so once that's been agreed by the minister and made, um, then I, I think we'll be engaging on a sort of a targeted um, stakeholder engagement process um, around the review with um, councils, statutory consultees, uh, community sector, business, environmental sector as well, just about um, views on, on, on how the, the Act is progressing. Uh, then, with a view to preparing a draft report, uh, again, no doubt, consulting the committee on, on that. Um, and it's likely that that report will bring forward a series of, of recommendations, um, you know, which are likely to cover some legislative change, um, policy issues, guidance, training, maybe areas to look into in more detail and so on. I don't want to preempt what comes out of it, but as you can understand, there's so much other work going on at the moment in parallel on improvements that need to be made to the system. You, you, you are, you, we are almost beginning to get a sense of, of some of the areas that need attention. Um, and then that will be agreed with the minister and released, and we will get into actually implementing some of those uh, some of those reviews. And I, I mean, the aim I think would certainly to be try and have that all done before the end of this financial year, um, at the very latest. So hopefully that was a bit of a helpful. I hope it wasn't too long run through, uh, just of, of where we are with it at the moment and what the current thoughts are. Happy to take questions, Great. obviously, Chair. Thank you very much. And obviously, the time frame of this is actually quite useful for the, for the committee to be to be aware of. Um, so, the review is being carried out internally, or are you bringing in um, external um, consultants in order to assist with this? No, we're not bringing in external consultants. We're we're doing it internally. Although we're obviously going to be engaging a lot um, with all the key stakeholders of the system uh, as well. But no, we're not. We're not bringing. We don't put, intend to procure any consultants to undertake the the review. Um, and obviously, the the terms of reference. Are quite broad on the on the face of that, um, and obviously you're primarily focusing on the original objectives of the act um, as it was as it was laid at that particular time. And obviously the context has changed quite considerably during that period, um, and there will obviously need to be a recognition, I suppose, really of the fact, as you've mentioned about COVID, and the desire really that infrastructure is a key stimulator for the economy and there have been various criticisms in relation to the the pace at which our planning system works will you be cognizant of that and i'm also mindful obviously of the ministerial advisory group on infrastructure and the piece of work that that they are carrying out uh, absolutely um yeah i mean that that's i think probably going to, inevitably will be a key element of, of the work that we do in the review um and it's, it's it's the main issue which is coming out of all the other strands of of work that we're doing, um, and indeed, um, the, the the independent panel on, on infrastructure, um, when it reports, um, there there may well be elements of it that will feed into this because, depending on what they say about the planning system, about mm -hmm. planning and delivery of infrastructure, uh, that that would be built into it as well, of course. Okay, and while while you've said that this won't be a, a root and branch um, review of the of the act. Um, it will be more than just a tick box exercise, won't it? As that we've essentially we have to do this, so you know that's it done. Um, are you adverse to bringing forward amending legislation if um, it's required? No, I mean I suppose the minister is very keen to make improvements to the system where it's possible to make make, but at the same time. Um, if, if there's if if there's a requirement for an amendment to primary legislation, which takes a, a long period of time, or if there's 
really, really very fundamental kind of changes that, that go right into the heart of, you know, it, was it right to transfer planning to councils and, you know, the different roles and functions of, of the departments and so on. I think that's probably something that, that, that we wouldn't be wanting to get into. It's more focused on getting into the sort of things you were talking about, Chair, in relation to actually how do we speed the system up? Can we bring, can we change the, the kind of the nuts and bolts of the system through subordinate legislation? Can we work with, with, with councils through training, guidance and that sort of thing to try, to try and improve that? Um, I don't think we, we, we sort of want to be getting into a, you know, a new planning act, a, you know, new, new primary um, mm -hmm. uh, um, legislation coming through um, at, at this stage, um, unless you know something comes out of the review that's really you know incredibly you know pointing in that direction, and, and, and we're persuaded by the evidence. But I think the focus that we're, we're on at the moment is more on let, let's get in and get things fixed as quickly as we can, um, so that the system works as well as it can work. Okay, I was just really trying to ascertain what your approach would be, as opposed to being very close, that you are actually open to change if change is seen to, to actually improve. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Mr Boylan? Thank you, Chair. Thanks. You're very welcome. I see Irene there as well. Um, it's a long time from we're not this and there, I have to say. <laughs> we're at the start of the process. Just a couple of key points, and I mean, um, the Chair did ask the question, and it, it's not a case of change in the primary, but there may be an opportunity in terms of subordinate legislation to tweak it. I mean, and, and just a few things I wanted to just throw out because I know people have come because um, I'm at, I'm on the public Accounts committee as well, so we've seen some of the audit reports and some of the recommendations. But just in case, in say in terms of the, the likes of the pre-application process and the community consultation process and the, the likes of notice of opinions, I mean, um, those kind of things are obviously will be looked at. To try and you said you say just have to, to try and speed the process up, but still have the proper consultation that people are feel that they're properly involved in it, because that's not the system was set up in the first place. But I think there's an opportunity there, and it just uh, you've clarified there there may be some some legislative tweaks in terms of board rules, which which I would welcome. But but in terms of obviously the the the, the infrastructure minister set up this commission to have a look at the process as well, just across. Uh, my main question would be for um, for yourselves. It was transferred to local authority. Obviously, there's questions there in times of time frames for major, the number of weeks, and also time frames for for local authority. Is is it your intention to look at that resource? Because when we transferred the model, um, obviously there was issues there in terms of you know had we the right model, had we the resource, because that will definitely speed up the and will that be part of the. The overall terms of reference, and you know, is that all incumbent of, of all we're trying to do? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I suppose firstly, definitely the pre-application um, discussion issue, the pre-application community consultation point, are, 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 are certainly in there, um, and will, will be looked at. And that those are key issues which are emerging from some of the other work that we've been doing um, about speeding the system up. A lot of the statutory consultees have identified issues with the quality of the applications that are coming in. There hasn't been the proper engagement with the community. The quality of the submissions themselves don't have all the information and so on. So that, that's certainly an area that we're, we're looking at. The councils as well have identified that as being an issue. Um, you know, a lot of time is wasted in the, in the dealing with the planning application, going back and forwards, mm -hmm. looking for more information, and looking for the right information, dealing with uh, communities who haven't been properly engaged with complaining about the application. You've got to go back then, ask for changes. You've got to go back to the statutory consultee and say, that, you know, this issue's been raised, that issue's been raised. What, you know, is it reasonable? What do we do about it? So there's a whole, uh, that's definitely a major area that, that we're already looking at and something we definitely bring into this. Um, on the sort of second point around um, the, the resourcing point, uh, I mean, you know, the, 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 the resource was transferred at the point of transfer. Um, the transfer of functions grant is sort of set and settled, and, and, and you know, DFC has been very clear that's certainly not up, up, up for grabs. Um, but we will be looking at, um, you know, what, what can we do to help councils the, with the resource that they have to try and speed the system up and try and deal with it more effectively and efficiently um, with the resource they have. I mean, councils have, have, since the transfer have already been um, using the, the sort of the planning fees and the income that they've got. I mean, councils are in a very bad situation now, but before the, 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 the crisis and have employed 
um, new planners in, into their teams uh, to try and help deal with some of the, 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 the backlog and issues that, that they have ha they do have. Um, so the focus that we'll be looking at is much more in terms of with our responsibilities for the policy and for the legislation, can we make fixes and changes to help um, um, deal with the, the applications more effectively and efficiently? And, and just two quick points, Chair, in terms of the obviously the committee would like to be involved and, and have their say in and all that, that you've, you've committed to. Absolutely. I, I knew when you asked the resource in terms of current, it's just to try and move the process on. That's, it's not to say they may need a resource or whatever. Yeah. That, that, that's the main thing. Um, sure, yeah, I think. Yeah, Chair, that'll, okay. that'll leave me. I know Thank we're all you. Comments, I'll Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I suppose at the outset, I would declare as previously a member of Arjun North Down Borough Council because it's relevant um, to this. Um, and I thank Angus and Irene uh, for coming here today. I think it's an important issue. Um, I think um, the planning, particularly as we try to recover from COVID-19, is going to be of particular importance as we better recover our, our economy. And I do acknowledge that you know the Planning Act of 2011 was a significant piece of legislation. So, like even last night, I was looking up to see where this review came from and was reading through the debate and who put the amendment and all the rest of it. This was a significant piece of legislation, and you know a complete root and branch. Um, you know, reform and new planning act and stuff like that is not something obviously that we're looking towards at the moment. And obviously, acknowledge that the audit officer are going to do their review around this. Um, but there is a need to do this um, this piece of work. Um, for example, around local development plans. My own personal view is that the level of progress around that has been slow. I am worried that some of them are never going to see the light of day at the pace of the progress we're seeing here. Um, so things like that do need to be reviewed. Um, within the terms of the review, it's 3C. It refers to to amend the Act, and I just want to tease out a wee bit more about what's the appetite for a, amendment. I know you've said I'm not wanting to do primary legislation, but there's 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 key issues here. It's really more of at a operational level that are inhibiting the Act. So you know, I asked the minister about the statutory consultees responses within the statutory uh, time limits, and in 1920 it was only 70 per cent. So there's a real issue there in terms of statutory consultees. So whether there will be an appetite to do amendments to, for example, have processing agreements and also statutory determination deadlines. You know, these are practical things which will help us address this, but whether there's an appetite to do that. And also I know Northern Ireland Water, they uh, have done a pre-development examination process and whether there will be a desire to put that on a statutory uh, fitting. Um, and the last one really is around planning applications. Um, I know local authorities are working to try to process those, but there are some applications that are received that are really poor quality, and there is a need to have a statutory process which actually filters those out to ensure that we can actually get these processed um, as soon as possible, because it is really, really important. And Kat, Kat, I'll squeeze in the last one. Kat raised the whole issue around sort of the pre-application process. That really should not be a tick box. That should be genuine engagement, and they should show that, that, that they are taking on board some of these comments. Cause some of the concerns I have from residents is they give their views as part of it, but they don't feel as if they're being taken on board and the application then just goes in. But these are these are practical things, and I don't know whether there will be an appetite to amend the legislation to ensure that we can actually get these changes. Um, yeah, I mean, there, <clears throat> I suppose there is there is there is the appetite uh, to implement changes, and a lot, a lot of the, the the issues that you've raised there um, are issues actually that you can change in support of legislation, and actually are issues that have emerged through some of the work we doing, particularly around the statutory consultees and the planning forum. Um, and you know, so for example, the point about um, getting the right information at the, at the right time is really like it's a validation checklist. At the moment, that's not legislative yeah. requirement. But uh, there's a very limited legislative requirement about what makes a valid application. So basically, you sign your name, you fill in the form, and you have your fee. It's valid, whereas the, the information is not acceptable, and, and therefore the, the, almost from you start, you're going back and forwards. So one of the things that I think I don't want to preempt what will come out of the review, but I mean one, one of the things I think will come out is or is that suggestion about bringing in a legislative provision that will make a, a much more stringent requirement on developers to provide the information that's really needed um, to assess the planning application, um, you know, at the start before it can be made valid. So you don't actually start the clock running uh, until you have the, the important information with you. 
Um, so, um, you know, I, th I think that that's going to be something that, that would be helpful. Processing agreements, I think, again, is something that, that's, that we're looking at as well. It came out of the, the report and is, is in the planning forum um, to have that. Uh, whether you need legislative provision to do that, um, I don't know. I mean, that's something that we will t we'll look at through, through the review. It may be the, possible that you can actually get that working. I know Belfast have already um, made strides in that, in that respect, you know, sort of administratively without a legislative requirement, and have got the, the key developers and agents sort of signed up to that. Um, so that is something, again, that, that we're looking at, because I think we do recognise that there's a sort of a quid pro quo, quo here in terms of, you know, um, if, they, if the right information is coming in, then there needs to be, you know, that needs to be dealt with then effectively and quickly. So there is an appetite to change legislation. Um, it, it's not that we're the, the terms of the review are kind of um, to, you know framed in the way of if, if this is an issue that looks like it needs primary change, we're not going to look at it. Not at all, and I don't want to leave you with that impression. But I suppose it's, it's, that takes a long time. So our, 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 well, with any legislation, legislation should really be the last resort. So if you can do something through guidance, through training, through uh, you know mutual agreement, you do it. But um, if you need legislation, you bring it in. Um, and I suppose we're, we're focused more on trying to make quick changes to the system as we go along, as opposed to that really fundamental um, level of change you tend to get when you're into this actual act and, and the primary legislation. But look, if something is emerges and the only fix is through primary legislation, then obviously we, we will look at that. I appreciate it because, to be honest, my time as elected representative, the one issue you get most frustration around is planning and the delays around that. So if there's any ways to <coughs> make quick changes to improve that, it would be really appreciated. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kelly. Uh, thanks, and thanks for the presentation. I welcome a review of planning, and I think I was about at that time too, Cal, oh, yourself. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and, and I'm sure your office is no different uh, to mine in terms of not only delay and delay from statutory consultees. And why is there a lot of to and fro? And there's a lot of blame going on. I mean, I had to intervene um, in a development uh, for social housing in Lurgan, where somebody sitting up in Belfast was saying about how there was a, a sewage line or a railway line, which was much further apart uh, than uh, the person in making a judgment in Belfast um, was able to make. So I think, do think uh, people need to be familiar with the area and get out of their offices a wee bit, not just rely on maps, no matter how good they are. But, but the, the biggest problem I have at the moment, moment is are one or two developers who, who, under different company names or guises, continually thumb their noses at enforcement and continually thumb their noses at the people to whom they sold their houses. I have people living in established d developments who are still linked into temporary uh, uh, sewage systems, and it's because the, there's a lack of enforcement. You know, in terms of uh, the process, takes far, far too long. We need a very short, snappy process. We need a fines that are commensurate with the experience of the householders who paid huge sums of money, and we also need uh, developers to be. Almost like a league table. There are particular developers who, have, who are different companies, and all they do is change the name of the company. And of course, the, the residents' hands are tied because if I was to go public and name the development, they then worry about the impact that will have on the price uh, and the saleability of their property. So the odds in terms uh, of those residents are stacked against them because of the uh, low level, the speed uh, of enforcement and the type of fines. So I, I nearly think there should be a league table of developers about who's good and who's bad in terms of meeting uh, planning conditions. So I think uh, in terms of following through the planning conditions, I'd like to see uh, a, a greater reassurance to be given uh, through legislation uh, and enforcement uh, to residents. Well, look, ab absolutely. I mean, that, that is a frustration, I think, with the planning system down through the years. Um, I personally find it very frustrating. I mean, the system is only as good as the, the enforcement, if, if you like. Um, so, you, you know, you can make good planning decisions, and if they're not implemented, um, it makes a mockery of the, of, the, of the whole system. So it is an area we do talk to the heads of planning about regularly, and we meet them um, regularly and, and, and 
you know, push it uh, as, as much as we can. And it is an area again that I think this review can can get into and, and look at. Um, and certainly, you know, we, we've produced guidance um, on enforcement to try and assist the councils in terms of the way they, they look at that and deal with that. Ultimately, though, I, mean, I do have to say that the responsibility fundamentally is because we transferred these powers over to councils, rests with the councils, um, and, and um, you know, it is in, it is up to them to. To, to take a, a, a proactive approach to enforcement well, and really, really work on that? Yes, but they can only do that within the confines and constraints of what the enforcement legislation is. And whenever there are cutbacks, it's enforcement that invariably falls by the wayside. And let's face it, whenever the power is transferred, <coughs> the resources didn't. You know, ratepayers had to pick up a large bit of the bill in terms of planning service. So, you know, uh, on beh- I'd have to speak a wee bit on behalf of Council uh, uh, in relation to that. Uh, so, can I ask then, in terms of how uh, the review will seek comments, will the likes of myself, for example, uh, and other MLAs and public representatives uh, be given an opportunity to feed through into the review what our experiences have been and work on behalf of many constituents and is there a way in which uh, that some of the infrastructure should be put in place before the development starts? I know we don't want to hamper, uh, because it is about having money in and sales and all the rest of it, but where you have repeat offenders, should there not be penalties whereby those developers should have the infrastructure in place before they're able to start building and selling the houses, or at least before the sales? Because I really don't think the law is on the side of the, the purchaser at, uh, in relation to enforcement of rogue developers, who thankfully are, you know, are, are relatively few, but significant enough uh, to, to give me quite an amount of work to do. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the, the, there will be engagement um, on the review and, and, and uh, to inform it. Um, we haven't quite worked out exactly how we're going to do that yet. Yeah, I sort of talked earlier about sort of key stakeholder engagement. Certainly at the committee, obviously, so you, I mean, you will be fully engaged in this. Um, but uh, that's certainly something that we want to make sure that all those views are, are fed into it. Um, and certainly we can look at, at this area of enforcement, understand that that is, that is an issue. Um, and um, you know, um, that's certainly something that, 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 that can be in there and, and can be considered. And I would have to say too that statutory consultees are uh, abysmal at times in doing their responses. They really are, you know, and this to and fro, and you've got a month to reply, and you, you know, and then it's another month, you know, before the chase. I think there's been an element of chasing people up, and certainly the applicant needs to know, you know, because sometimes they're caught between the consultant or the engineering company and planning, and they don't often know uh, where the fault bl- uh, line lies. So um, I would hope you take those views on board. Thank okay, you, thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> and I was just wanting to touch upon the, the major projects at another committee where we're looking at the capital schemes and the delays caused there and why it's taken so long. And it emerged that there was quite a significant number of uh, major projects were in the in the process for access of five years, which came as quite of a shock. Surely as we try to rebuild the economy, it's gonna take more than a tweak to fix that at the top end of the pyramid. Say, get the exact figure, but it was very, very worrying as to how many was in over five years in the process. Yeah, no, absolutely. The the the, the system, um, the big area of concern in the system, I think, generally has been the majors, the major planning applications. You know, targets have not been met in that area across all the councils. I think it's fair to say they've been meeting the targets in the local um, developments. Some local developments are quite big in, in, in Northern Ireland because the thresholds are quite high, but the major developments have been a big problem. That was really the focus of the, the report uh, into the performance of, of the planning system in relation to statutory consultees, um, which, in a, which, which led to the setting up of the planning forum, which is actually looking most specifically at the performance in terms of majors uh, and what the, the issues are with, with that. Uh, and it is a complex picture. I mean, it's not just you know the, the, the fault of the statutory consultees. Um, you know, when you actually dig into this, there's a lot of issues in there. There's 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 case management issues about the way planning applications are handled and managed. There's issues about over consultation. You know, where you're going back and forward and back and forward. We talked earlier about the problem with the quality of the submissions that come in. You send it to the statutory consultee. Statutory consultee comes back and goes, "This isn't the right information I need to make the judgment for for this particular case." For five years. 
Well, there's, there's, there can be there can be turn and froing on, on applications. Some of the Northern Ireland see that sort of record. They're, they're going to turn and go somewhere mm -hmm. else. That's, that's shocking. Then. And it is. It's unacceptable, and it, it's why we, we're focusing on it. And it is, of, of, as well as that, going to be something that we focus on in, in this review as well. In terms of, I think we just want to make sure that we we, we, we don't oversimplify it, and we look at all the contributing factors to this because it's it, it's been a problem with the planning system for many years. Not just here; it's a problem when I talk to my counterparts in the other jurisdictions. You know, they also have the difficulties. It it. it it's a complex system where lots of different regulatory requirements come in, along with um, public and community, you know, objection and, and, and opposition to things. Um, and it's really where that all comes together. Uh, and it is difficult to, to work on some of these areas very quickly. But we need to find ways and means of trying to do that. Uh, and that's what we're and focused on. That's going to take time. And obviously, as we try to rebuild COVID, we don't have that time. You know, we need, need boots on the ground. <coughs> And again, that's why the focus is to do this quickly. Um, I mean, we've, you know, as I said at the start, there's parallel streams of work going here. So, you know, we're already um, working with the councils to make improvements to try and uh, deal with this issue, uh, and with statutory consultees as well. Um, so, it's certainly something we're massively focused on and really want to try and try and address. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Angus. Just in respect, the Chair has touched earlier on the internal review. Who is actually heading that up within your department? Well, I suppose the, the review is sitting in, on my side in the, in the department. Um, so uh, it's, 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 it's in um, the regional planning directorate, which is the directorate which, which I kind of lead on. So, yeah. and, do, do you, and this is no reflection on you personally. Do you see that as a conflict that you're reviewing your, part of the stuff you're overseeing? Um, no, no, not really. I, I think that um, you know it, it, we, we have the way that the, the central government planning planning department is structured. There's there's kind of there's two directorates. The one that I'm in charge of is legislation, policy, um, and those sorts of issues. And then Alistair Beggs, my colleague in there, he deals with the casework um, and the strategic planning applications. So there's a good separation there in terms of any you know potential conflict of interest when you think of the the strategic applications we're dealing with. But when you, when you look at the sort of the remit that I have, I, I think actually the, the, it's it's kind of it's a good situation that I, that I am in because I'm able to actually I do a lot of engagement with the, with the councils and I have a lot of that understanding of how the planning system is working. Uh, and then also, you know, I have my colleagues on the other side of the house to talk to about the reasonably significant applications and the issues with those in terms of the processing and, um, you know, that real interrelationship with staff consultees and all the issues that they have in terms of trying to deal with those applications So as who, well. who made that decision then, Angus, that that stayed internally and didn't go outsourced? Well, I mean, there, the, there, the, there was no decision to not necessarily go, go outsource. It was basically a requirement on us to deliver the, the, that, that provision in the Planning Act and undertake okay. that review. And so there was no decision to, to, to sort of to have it done externally. Okay, and then a couple of small points. In regard to your fair to Mr. Muir and Mr. Moyle, just spoke about a quality of applications coming in. How do you see that being improved? Is that a where's that failure happening? That you, you know. You're, out, you're jumping through two hoops and you jump through another hoop. If people knew they had to jump through three hoops at the start, they would know what they deal with. Where is that falling down? And that, that goes right down to council as well level, irrespective of you know, the bigger uh, process. Yeah. No, I, I, I think, as, as we've touched on, a lot of it is to do with the work that happens pre the submission of the planning application. So the pre-application discussions that take place um, with um, the, the planners and the statutory consultees around what the expectations are for the particular planning application, particularly if it's a major one. Also, that, that pre-application engagement that takes place with community for major applications. So there's a, you know, an understanding before the application comes in as to what the issues are with the community. Those can be fixed and dealt with before uh, the clock starts. And then I think finally, what we touched on earlier, it will be important to think in terms of actually how you validate a planning application. So when it comes in, um, you need to have um, a, a high degree of good quality information with the application in order to make it valid. And if you don't, sorry, it just waits um, and the clock doesn't start. Okay, one final point. Uh, retrospective planning seems to be a big issue, certainly not in Ulster. I'm not sure about all areas. And there's a mindset. You, but not necessarily build what you want, but you do what you want. Go for retrospective planning, and you get it. Is any working on between your department and councils to say, well, you know, on looking at the percentage figures of how many retrospective plan applications are submitted and always pass? 
Um, we, no, we don't actually collect that particular um, piece of information, but it's something we certainly look at um, and, and, and gather that. Um, we do. We we ha I mean, we are aware of the issue with retrospective planning applications. It is a, it's a feature of all the planning um, uh, jurisdictions in these islands, um, and it's I suppose um, you know back to whenever we we, did, we brought through the planning act, there were discussions at that stage about whether you criminalise. Um, planning um, and introduce a, a system where if if somebody builds a fence or an extension or a porch and um, without planning permission it, it, does that become a criminal offence and you move down that road very much at that time the assembly uh, and the executive were focused on not going down that road and and, and really having the system where it is possible to regularize development um, after it happens because sometimes you know genuinely people do make those mistakes the issue is that that you need to um, where that's not the case and where something's unacceptable and had an application come in would have been refused then you need to go down that road refuse the retrospective application and take enforcement action and the the councils have all the the, the menu of, of um, processes and and um, tools at their disposal to do that Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson, and then Ms. Um, thank you, thank you, Angus, for, for that presentation. And, and Irene, uh, uh, I know you're there listening. Given that you said it's not um, a written branch review, um, I'm concerned that it sounds very much like a desktop review. And therefore, I would like to understand the extent and the scope of the review. Has that been determined? Well, I mean, I suppose the extent and the scope is, is as set out in the in the regulations, which is which are the terms of reference, and they're actually very broad, um, because they're they talk about looking into the objectives, the original objectives of the Planning Act and, and the reform. Um, but um, I mean, we don't want the review to be limited, and we do want the reviewers have said to make sure that all all views and and um, uh, issues with the planning system are are, are, are kind of factored in, into it. And I mean, I suppose I would add to that that. You know, certainly um, over the years of me being, being involved in planning, I don't think there's been a time when there's been more of a focus on planning in terms of all the different things that are going on, whether it's the planning forum, the, the, the public accounts com co uh, committee interest, um, and the you know the uh, CBI report that's coming out. Uh, there's there's a lot going on, investigating and checking and providing us with information and, and um, evidence about what's going on with the planning system and what the problems are. So, you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty confident that we will have a really good sort of evidence base, if you like, going into the, this review uh, about what the issues are with, with the system. Okay, well, given that we all know look, the original objectives and we're conscious of what David said, because we have met a number of stakeholders who are quite annoyed, and rightly so, because of the length of time it has taken and it's still taken to have some of their applications processed. And, you know, the original objectives you're saying is a target of 30 weeks. And whilst that has improved and it went into council by six weeks, I believe, uh, and it's now somewhere like 52 to 54 weeks, it's still double uh, the target. Like it's, it's nowhere near reaching its target. So I, I'm, I'm concerned that um, as we go into post-COVID recovery, I'm also conscious what the audit office has said. We don't want to move too fast in the wrong direction because we've had the criticism chair from some of the expenditure. But that said, the planning process itself that's why I ask about it only being a desktop review, because I actually think it needed a root and branch review, because of the concerns that have been brought to our table and all of us experience as MLAs. Well, I, I think um, you know I understand that, and um, I suppose you know it's maybe root and branch review is the wrong word word to use. I think all the issues that that uh, you know we're hearing about the planning system and the concerns that people are raising which come across i think probably all of our all of our desks actually in, in, in different ways um will be fully considered um you know we don't want to um there's no sense at all that that's that's what the, this review is a desktop exercise or a tick box exercise or any of those i mean the minister is genuinely concerned about the problems with the with the planning system um you know we we, we do have a lot of issues raised and um, with the department about that um, and it's certainly something that we want to address as fully and as, and as effectively as we can through through this review and through the other mechanisms that we're um, involved with okay i just want to pick up on the point on the uh, the full consideration that's going to be given for instance to developers as has been raised previously I have a situation in Derry, and I can call it out now because it's gone on now for over 10 years, in uh, Woodland Woods, Woodland Heights, Woodland Place. And just has been said, I'm going between the road service, uh, NI Water, 
and the issue of trying to get the roads adopted, trying to get the sewage sorted out. And this has gone on for well over 10 years. For those residents uh, who are still stuck in a process and I'm um, trying to get everyone around the table. So to pick up that point about developers and how we ensure that what they take on can be enforced. Are you looking at, if I have, go to, to another place in Derry, um, the barley fields, beautiful houses there, but because the road's not adopted, you're talking about almost nearly a quarter of a mile that some at the bottom of the, the, the estate, which is still being developed, having to drag their bins right up to the top of the, because they cannot get that's the right. bin lorries in. That's right, that's right. And they're still developing. And because they're still developing, then they don't <coughs> yeah. have to be dealing with the roads. Yeah. So all of these problems need right. to be dealt with when we're looking at this review. And the, will the review capture? problems like that, so that residents who spend a lot of money, people taking out big mortgages to buy great homes, as they hope, and they go in and they're dealing with roads outside, their pathways outside their door, the roads not adopted, the bins not coming in, the sewage not right, and we could all give you examples mm -hmm. across the north of problems like that mm -hmm. that we're facing. So is the review, and will the review capture all of that and actually bring forward a recommendation to deal with it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I mean, this is obviously it's an issue that's been raised a couple of times today, and, and you know, I think we can definitely take that away. It's also, it's also an issue that, that, that comes through in correspondence to us as well. Um, we are aware of it. It, it involves um, not just planning, but also colleagues in, in roads and in water as well, and, and the bond system that's in place. Um, and you know, trying to enforce that bond? And trying to enforce that should that be bond. used more yeah. often than what Ab it is? Absolutely, but I, I suppose, you know, it, it'll. It'll just, I'm just saying it, we will look at it, but it's something that will engage other uh, parts of the department as well, and certainly we'll, we'll be doing that. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ms Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Angus and um, Irene, for coming today. Like others, I suppose I could, I have quite a number of examples, and, and I suppose I was a councillor when the, the powers transferred, and I've been, had been a councillor for a number of years, so I know there's been quite a, a settling in period for that. Um, and in, in, in my area, for Newry um, Arm Road and Newry Morning Down Council, we would have had quite a number of issues, particularly with length of time. Um, just one of the things that kind of has struck me as we've been talking as well, and as part of the review, Angus, is, is it likely to be looking at um, good practice in, in different council areas? I know one of the things, I'll give you an example, um, at the minute, I suppose, with COVID, we're, we're very keen to get investment uh, into our towns and cities in terms of helping with the recovery. And I'm dealing with an issue at the minute around um, a pretty major investment for, for Newry that was submitted last October, and we're told 15 weeks, and, and we're still waiting. And it's statutory consultees that are holding that up. Um, so in terms of prioritising that and, and looking at good practice from across different council areas for planning applications, but how we get this, how we improve on times, is that something that will um, be looked at as part of the review? Um, absolutely, that is something that will, that will be looked at. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, again, it, 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 it's a focus that we have anyway, actually, with, with our kind of regular meetings with the heads of planning and the continuous improvement to the programme that we try to bring through that. So, um, you know, there are some councils do try things differently and then they kind of report back to that and that's shared in terms of did it work, did it not work. In fact, actually, the stuff I was talking about on the validation checklist is something that Belfast kind of led on and mm -hmm. the other councils have sort of looked at that and thought it's a sensible idea. So have we and we're going to build that into the review. But absolutely, best practice is definitely in there as being something that we want to look at and encourage. Yeah, I think and like it's it's like everything else. There's no point in reinventing the wheels. So if there's examples there, because I know even from speaking to individual developers who are able to say, well, in such and such an area, I don't have this issue, or it's been a lot quicker. So I think that's a, that would be a good start. Um, just I suppose in terms of of the length of time for the review, and then obviously the implementation of of any recommendations being brought forward. You know, have we got a time scale in terms of how long the review will take, and then subsequently? Um, how long we would like, you know, you think it would take to implement, implement anything coming out of that? Well, I think that we're we're hopeful to try and get the review report, if you like, sort of agreed and out before the end of the financial year, um, at, at the latest. And ideally, we'd try to get it out a bit a bit sooner than that. Um, although I'm kind of picking up lots of issues here today, in a sense, so you yeah. know, I'm conscious I'm going to have to um, build build those in. Um, 
But uh, yeah, abs absolutely. And then following on from that, we're in the implementation. But I suppose what I should say is because there's so much of the part of work going on anyway on, on this uh, issue, whether it's the planning forum, the work that we're doing with with the councils, um, uh, you know, the CBI report that's coming through, there's a lot of things that almost, you know, <clears throat> if we can do it, it's, if it's sensible and we can do it, you know, my view is that we should just do it. Yeah. You know, provided minister and committee and so on are, are content with that. So it's not quite the sense that you know there, this is you know we're going to stop everything do a review wait until the end of march and then decide to do stuff i suppose one of the messages i want to get across to you today is that there's a load of stuff going on already anyway mm -hmm. and if there's something that comes out of that work that's really sensible we'll we'll probably try and push that on anyway we'll put, we'll, we'll include it in the review report um, and as being part of that, but it's just that we're not kind of just not doing anything, waiting for the review, and then going to do a lot of stuff. So hopefully, stuff will begin to change, and measures will come forward almost immediately. Yeah, no, and I think that's that's quite good. It's a sensible approach because there's things that really need addressed fairly quickly. So if it's good that it's nearly almost on a rolling basis. Yeah. Just the last question, I suppose, on that. If the, then, if there's anything major coming out, of it, has the department committed then to adopting those recommendations coming out of the review? Forward. Um, well, obviously, the minister would, would, would see the recommendations and, mm -hmm. and um, will agree with the recommendations or not, depending yeah, on, okay. on, on what those are. It will be really her call, subject to all the consultation. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, okay, Chair. Thank you. Mr Beggs. Thank you again. Thanks for your presentation. The, the, the planning system gets the blame when anything goes wrong. And sometimes it is your specific responsibility, but also sometimes it's maybe just slightly outside, but clearly connected to the whole planning process. So my question is, will your review be looking at the development system, looking at all aspects of it, to catch out the situations where you have irresponsible developers, um, to catch out the situation where road service have been late. I mean, one uh, unadopted road in, in, in my patch, it took 18 years to draw down the road bonds. I mean, that was just ridiculous. Um, uh, and another a, a mechanism to ensure that there's greater understanding and transparency of each, uh, each's responsibility. Uh, I have come across, um, for instance, private developments um, where there is no road bonds and my reading following the legislation, a big responsibility falls on the solicitor conveying the property to make sure the individual is aware of that and the risks associated and to make that very clear and to make the individual aware that they can sue their solicitor if he does not make them aware of that. So my main bit is to focus on what will you be ensuring that the wider responsibility of the development process is knitted, knitted together and not simply look at the technical planning process? Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, and um, it's one that is kind of a, a big issue for, for us, actually, um, because you're right, people do seem to see, to see the planning system almost as being the solution for all problems to do with development and also the problem when there's a difficulty with, with development. Whereas part of the issue with planning is there's so many different kind of you know bodies and people and agencies involved in, in, in the process um, that you need to understand that bigger picture in order to kind of fix the planning system or in order to understand really what the what the issue is. So yes is the answer. I, I that would be my approach. I I, I'm, I always try to look at the bigger picture in terms of what it is the planning is, is is trying to do and achieve, and we will be doing that as part of the review. So we will be trying to engage obviously on the issue that's been raised about bonds and so on with with the other statutory consultees, and we will be trying. To make the point that um, you know um, a lot of the delays which, which happen in the system are blamed on planners and planning, but quite often it's it's because there hasn't been proper engagement early in the process. The community have been uh, have been ignored. Local elected representatives have been ignored, and then suddenly everybody's shocked whenever. Um, there's a whole hoo-ha when the planning application comes in, and there's lots of objections, and everything's delayed, and nobody's happy. Uh, so, you know, I, I will definitely be pushing that angle, if you like, in, in terms of the way you look at planning. The other uh, aspect of this, which which I've come across, which certainly needs looked at, is spine road development, which is going to be developer-led. Uh, there seems to be a disconnect uh, on occasions between uh, the area plan. Uh, and the ultimate spine road development. Uh, I can think of one instance where a significant bit of the spine road is developed upstream 
but there's a, a section that is still not even approved for a, a, a development, it's still green, uh, green zoned, uh, and therefore the, the full route will never be developed until that, that connection is made. Uh, and then secondly, in terms of spine road development, uh, how are you going to ensure that um, in, unscrupulous individuals do not use sections of the spine road um, uh, as a ransom strip? Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, the, the, the approach to that is to have, you know, really good comprehensive planning for, for, for that particular area and that, that particular development. So, you know, in, in, the, in the area plan that comes forward that, that looks at the transport needs associated with developments and proposed in that area, that needs to properly um, deal with the issue of what, what, what accessibility and road requirements are there for, are required for that development. And then that in key site requirements, you know, so that whenever the planning application comes in for the development, um, whether it's through conditions or through um, a developer agreement, uh, Section 76 agreement, that the, the, the road is developed um, as part of that. Um, and, you know, th th that it's done in the right sequence, if you like, so that, you know, you don't get a situation where sterile, you know, you get sterile land, um, which is not possible to develop. Um, because uh, how, do, how do you ensure that you do not have orphan sections of the road not connected to development land? Because that has occurred. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, well, I suppose it's on a simple level, it's, it's just good planning. Um, you know, it's thinking it through properly at the plan stage so that the key site requirements are there so that you can't, um, you know, develop um, unless the bits that are needed before you develop are done um, and, and if that needs to be a condition or it needs to be in a planning agreement then then so be it um, and so that you know so that you, you, you actually you know you're in a difficult situation the best you know depending on the developers the best way forward in this and it's happened in some I mean it's happened, it's happened actually in some of the sites in, in, in Derry I think very effectively where the planners work closely with a with a group of developers and there's actually proper collaboration um, where you know almost things come forward in a timely fashion um, but you know it can be difficult and it's not it's not easy because it, you, you're still faced with dealing with determining a planning application as and when it comes in you can't sort of say you know this planning applications come in too early we want to wait for the one that would, would be makes more sense for the other one to come through so you still have to determine it you're statutorily obliged to do so so you, you have to try and control some of the issues that you're talking about through either agreements or conditions but I say a specific problem I'm aware of arose because the original landowner siphoned off selling portions of the land and left a, a section of the spine road as an orphan with no development land in, in the same ownership. So surely that was a failure in the planning system. I would. I mean, honestly, I would need to. I would need to see the detail of it, uh, you know, to, to understand it. But I, I mean, I do understand the issue, and it is something that we we do um, consider and and talk about a lot in planning in terms of trying to avoid those sorts of things happening, and particularly ransom strips as well. And there are ways of doing it if you are wise to it when the planning application comes in and put the right conditions and so on on there. Okay. okay, and Mr. Boylan and Ms. Kel Ms. Kelly have indicated their sure, sure, just quick, short questions. Just quickly, because I mean, it, it all seems that the, you know we know what went through to bring the plan. Like, there's a major piece of legislation it took a long time, and people got to understand exactly. It's not the panacea to solving all these problems, but and and the, the terms when you say root and branch, I understand. It's not the right terminology here because we're not going back to change major legislation. But there is opportunities through subordinate legislation and other ways of doing it. Absolutely. But you have to take into totality all the reasons that have been held up. NAW, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the electricity into it, or all those things. But, but what I would ask on behalf of the committee or through the chairs, if we can clearly identify the responsibilities in terms of where we think there's going to be subordinate legislation, where we think guidelines will work, and, and try and line it out that way, then we'll get a better understanding as a committee how because. Some of it doesn't lie within the remit of the actual planning act itself, but if we work collectively, then we'll be, and I, I would like to see that implemented overall as part of you, and that would be terms, the terms of review to collectively bring all these people together to try and, try and best solve it, because even when we look at the audit report, the audit report says 54 weeks, but it doesn't say that NAE held up the, or NAW held up, or, or you don't understand me. There's a collective there, and that's what I want to see, the review carry out on behalf of us all that try and resolve it. 
Yeah, Thank no, I think that's, that, that's, that's sensible. That, that's, I think that's something we can definitely do. Yeah. Speak of a right just the department try and outline some of that stuff, but okay. I'll bring it up again. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Chair. I just want to ask if the PSNI will be a consultee uh, in relation to that, because there, there are issues about designing out crime and around road safety, because we see more and more um, residents wanting traffic calming measures within uh, the development. And I just wonder, would that be a consideration that you might look at as well? Um, I suppose the designing out crime thing and, and, and that sort of work sits more within the kind of planning policy re regime as opposed to you know the provisions of the act and almost the nuts and bolts of how the planning system works. So you know that that is something that we look at more and more on that side of the, of the work that we do. I think this this one is going to be more focused on the process, if you like, of planning rather than the policy around planning and what we're trying to achieve from planning. That's a whole other. <laughs> You know, um, um, briefing for the committee, but you know, so there, there's, there's work. Uh, you know, I, I know what you mean, but I think it's probably more likely that we'll be looking at the more the okay. process elements of this. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you very much um, for your attendance today. Okay. Um, Irene didn't really get an opportunity to <laughs> say anything. Quietly, yeah. I think if she'd been here, she would have probably. I think, I think that that's probably <laughs> taking all the notes. <laughs> yeah. That's something that maybe other witnesses maybe need to think about <laughs> how they appear. Yeah, how that works. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. So just to follow up, then, just in relation to um, the comment that you made. Yeah, Chair. Just if if we can find out exactly in relation to the terms of review, I, I think at the end of this review there's going to be subordinate legislation yes. needed, but there's also going to be guidelines. So we need it right to the department and that. As soon as they can outline how they're going to deal with it as part of the review, that's what I'd be writing up. You know, because you will take guidelines, you will take legislative frameworks in, and how they're going to interact with all those other agencies that are holding the process up, i.e., any NAW, NAE is another issue, enforcing the bonds, That's people right. mentioned, but mm -hmm. all those things collected because everybody thinks when we do this, we're going to solve all the planning and stuff. There's bodies sitting outside it. I think when you mentioned the validation, is a simple one where statutory agencies are definitely responding. We can do that at all. So and and right. of course, the majority of those statutory agencies actually fall within the same department, yeah. ironically. Oh, no, 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 absolutely. So. absolutely. And, and it's, it's, it's just when you read the Planning Act, it just it shows you who's responsible. Who's okay, members content with that? Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Now, you have to actually make a call. Um, we have to be out of here by 12 o'clock. I don't think we're so. We're we not, only have 25 minutes, and I'm not sure that we're really going to give. Which I'm, I, I, I apologise, and we will apologise to uh, yes. if we do decide to do this. But I don't think that we're going to give it justice. Um, I have spoken to the clerk, and we would have availability on the 14th in order to be able to do that. Now, unfortunately, because we were restricted for the two hours from next week on, we will revert to our three-hour slot, okay. so which allows us a little bit more time. Okay. This was obviously an important piece justice. that we that we needed to spend time right. on this morning. Okay. So it's too important um, an issue to rush. Right. If you're, if you're content, um, and we'll send our, our, our apologies, obviously, because there are four officials um, mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah, if we do that. Okay. So members content. Okay. And, thank and, you. And chair, perhaps. Moving Moving then to our forward work programme. Uh, oh, sorry. No, no, Chair, I was just going to say probably in future when we have got just a two-hour slot, we might just have one uh, presentation uh, because when we're interrogating it, um, we know it can more take ideas, a bit longer. More, more well, of course, this, this was an, this, the planning review was an additional yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, from, from two weeks ago where we, we did actually, I think, justifiably needed to stay in order yeah. to we never asked examine. The yeah. Sorry, <laughs> we never asked for the, we agreed the SL one, but we were never asked just to. Okay, so, um, and I think what we will do then, when they come the next time, we'll, we'll bring these officials then to at the start of the meeting, as opposed yeah. to yeah. Um, a sec, mm -hmm. uh, as their second um, set of witnesses. Okay, so moving then to the forward work programme at item 13, which is at page 169. Obviously, in light of the previous um, conversation, that will be amended accordingly. Um, are members content? Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. Okay. Do members have any other business which they wish to raise at this juncture, um, Ms. Kimmins? Yeah, sure. It's just um, I'd actually was going to raise it in terms of the Brexit briefing, but it's an it's an issue that has arisen this week um, where Boss Aaron has uh, cut the the Belfast to Dublin route, 
um, which is obviously very concerning. And, and I know in the, uh, there has been other examples, ex um, Martina, I know, regarding dairy and, and things like that. But it's just to say, could we maybe write to the minister to ask if she's engaging with the transport minister in the south around this? Um, I know myself, because it stops in Uri. It's a, it's a major, major um, bus route. Yeah. And it just, I know the, the Translink, uh, Ulster bus, I forget the name, the, the yeah. goal line is yeah. still running. Like, yeah. But it was just to see what the issues are and, and what we can do about it, because it, it would be a huge loss okay. um, for, it might be for the area. to ascertain whether or not that will let, whether Translink can enhance the service uh -huh. in yeah. order to meet the need as well. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you, Chair. OK, agreed. Yep. Agreed. Okay, agreed. Thank you. Um, anything further at this stage? Okay, just to advise members, obviously, whenever you're leaving, to maintain social distance. I wanted us to write about the budget. Oh, sorry, in relation, um, Mr. Beggs, obviously, at our previous session, we had a conversation with regards to um, the budget process. Um, and obviously, we need to have some information back from the department, just on something yes, that you uh, raised. Uh, yes. the, the, uh, we were given a. Um, a rough idea of the various projects to go through, and it started on oh. the 16th of September, where um, information had to be given from the department to the Department of Finance. And I think, as a committee, we should be seeking uh, a copy of the uh, the guidance or the information that was available that had been submitted to the finance to have a better understanding of the budget process for this department. Okay, and I think it was in the same in the same vein, obviously, in relation to the the monitoring round. There seemed to be a, a reluctance um, for the department to come forward in order to share that information with us as well. So, um, when they come to see us next week, um, they may want to have some um, comments with regards to the budget process as well. Mr. Boyle. I also to thank Susie for the research paper we got at the table yesterday because it was a good piece of information. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, anything else? Okay, so members, um, remember to maintain your social distancing and remove all of your belongings as you're leaving the room. The next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 7th of October, in the Senate Chamber oh. Parliament Buildings. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. <laughs>